Okay, welcome to another exciting edition here of uh, Advanced Level Chemistry here at Spain Park. Today is a rainy Friday, March the 18th. Yes, it is March Madness, but we're going to have some madness here in chemistry. But it's not good. <laughs> yeah, and most of it is you getting mad at me for not letting you watch March Madness. <laughs> so, uh, and, and uh, once again, if uh, you are enjoying these videos, please feel free to subscribe to my channel. <laughs> hey, and don't, hey, don't be afraid to like the video either. I went last night and realized I had no likes. And so, you like, right. so my stepson went in and liked about three of them just so I wouldn't feel bad. <laughs> okay, so, okay, so. What causes pressure? James. What causes pressure other than tests? Okay, it's, it's atoms or molecules colliding with the container walls. More collisions equals more pressure. More molecules equals more collisions equals more pressure. So we were talking about all the different ways we measure pressure. The most common way is in terms of millimeters of mercury. Again, when we're talking about uh, a barometer, what's keeping this water up here in this tube now? Atmospheric. atmospheric pressure pushing down. Because in order for this water to come out, the water level inside the beaker has to come up. Well, the atmosphere weighs more than this water, so the atmosphere is pushing down with a greater pressure then the water, and so as a result, the water stays up here. How tall, of, how many feet of water do we have to have to equal that? Feet. Between 33 and 34 feet of water would equal the weight of the atmosphere. The equivalent, you know, pounds per square inch. So what liquid do we use instead? Mercury. Mercury. So it only takes 760 millimeters, which is about this much, millimeters of mercury to equal the weight of the atmosphere. So we use the barometer to measure atmospheric pressure as the mercury rises and falls. As the rainy, nasty day like today, it's probably a low pressure system. We asked Siri this morning, and the, the pressure was 29.91 inches. What is it, what's standard atmospheric pressure in inches? You might want to refer to your notes. 29.92, so we're just a barely below normal atmospheric pressure, but I bet now if we checked it again, it's probably a little bit lower as this low pressure is just kind of working its way through, okay? Good weather is generally high pressure. What do we use to measure vapor pressure? Uh, no. A manometer, and that's just a U-tube that has then you, you push the pressure against that. And what is vapor pressure? It's like when you, you make the vapors of another gas or of another, like. I'm, uh, it's right here in front of me. It's like the vapors of something else and they push along against the mercury. Okay, well, you're, you're talking about. Blank. So in our manometer, we have a U-tube. Okay? Here's the U-tube full of mercury. And with nothing attached to it, the mercury levels are going to be the same on both sides. But then over here, we have a flask with, let's just say, some ethanol in it. That's what we used yesterday. And then that's going to be attached to this, like this. It's some tube coming through a rubber stopper. A lot of times you put a valve there so you can control it. Okay? So this is a manometer. Now what's going to happen to that ethanol? What is that ethanol naturally going to do? Vaporize. Vaporize. It's just going to evaporate some. Okay? So then some of those are going to come through here. And they're going to push down on this. And what's going to happen then to that mercury? 
It's going to go down on one side and up on the other. So it's going to come down to say here and then go up to here. And so then we're going to end up having this difference. This is going to be my millimeters of mercury. This would be the vapor pressure then of my ethanol. Okay, let's stay focused. Okay, the vapor pressure of my ethanol. Now, if I heat this up, what's that gonna do to my rate of evaporation? Speed it up. It's gonna speed it up. What does that mean about the number of vapor molecules? It's gonna go up. So what does that mean about my vapor pressure? Go it's going to go up and so this is going to push down farther this is going to push up higher and we have more millimeters of mercury supported okay so this is a way to measure the vapor pressure now what if i put water in here is water going to evaporate uh, as fast as the ethanol no so i'll have fewer va water vapor molecules right what does that mean about its vapor pressure it's going, to be lower. it's going to be lower so what's the relationship between attractive forces and vapor pressure so the lower the attractive forces Okay, so the lower the attractive forces, the weaker the attractive forces, the more readily it evaporates. So the more vapor molecules you're going to have, which means the greater the vapor pressure is going to be. Now, when does a liquid boil? Oh, when it's like on Okay, so we look at this graph that's in your textbook. That's that black thing on your table there that you should take home and read. I mean, you have it on your Chromebook, okay? It's always very helpful to read, okay? <laughs> Looking at me like, yeah, right, okay? So, here's three different liquids, diethyl ether, ethanol, and water, the vapor pressure. Now notice, as we're increasing the temperature, what's happening to the vapor pressure? As I increase the temperature, the vapor pressure is increasing, okay? Because it's evaporating more. Now, it's obvious, I mean, the hotter something is, the faster it's gonna evaporate. Mm -hmm. So you're gonna have more vapor molecules, so you have more vapor pressure. Why is the normal boiling point of water right here 100? What does the dotted line represent? Normal atmospheric pressure, right? Okay, and so normally we make a substance boil by increasing the temperature. We put the pot on the stove, we turn the heat on, we heat it up until finally the, the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure and it boils. Now, on a day like today, where it's a little bit lower pressure, what's that mean about its boiling point? It's gonna boil a little bit lower, okay? If I go to the mountains, it's gonna boil at a little bit lower temperature because the pressure is less, because there's less air above you. But have you all ever heard of a pressure cooker? Yeah. Okay, that's the one where the lid seals down onto it, okay? And so when the water when it begins to heat up and evaporate, the steam can't escape like it can in an open pot. So as the steam collects on the inside, you get more and more vapor molecules, the pressure goes up. And so what does that do to the boiling point? As the pressure increases, what happens to the boiling point? It goes, it goes, if the higher the pressure, the boiling point increases. Okay, okay, because boiling point is when the vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure. So if the atmospheric pressure is higher, we have to have a higher vapor pressure, which means we need a higher temperature. So now when you put your, your spaghetti noodles, normally remember, remember way back at the beginning, what happens to the temperature during a phase change? Say what? You're right. It remains the same. It, uh, I don't have a board to write on. Uh, I'm going to erase my acid base equations.
So we learned way back when that if we look at temperature versus energy versus energy, what's energy measured in? Joules. Joules. Okay, that's going to look like this. Okay, so when we're causing a, a phase change to occur, okay, it's going to be at constant temperature. So when you're boiling your spaghetti noodles in normal water, what's the temperature of the boiling water? 100 degrees. No matter how fast or vigorously it's boiling, the water stays at 100 degrees. So you're cooking your spaghetti noodles or whatever you're boiling, boiling potatoes or whatever you happen to be boiling, it's cooking at 100 degrees no matter how vigorous you have it. But if I have a pressure cooker and I increase the pressure, now it's going to be boiling at 140, 150 degrees rather than 100 degrees. So what does that mean about the rate at which your food cooks? You can make it hotter so it cooks faster. It's get the hotter water means it's going to cook faster. Now in the mountains, when the pressure is just always less, water is going to boil at a lower temperature. So instead of it being 100 degrees, it's going to be like 95 degrees Celsius. So things take longer. So people use the pressure cookers in the mountains to kind of artificially imitate the atmospheric pressure so things will cook faster in the mountains. But as it is, if you ever look like at a cake box or something, they give high altitude baking instructions because the water is going to boil, the cake's going to rise, everything's going to be different because everything's at a lower temperature. It's all about atmospheric pressure. Okay? So, here's the relationship that I want to make sure you know. The weaker the attractive force, what does that mean about vapor pressure? The higher the vapor pressure, what does that mean about its boiling point? Okay, this is our weakest attractive force, right? It's the highest vapor pressure. What does that mean about its boiling point? The lowest boiling point, because because it's easier for it to reach atmospheric pressure. It's always got a higher vapor pressure. Boiling occurs when the vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure. Since at any temperature, it's got the higher vapor pressure because it's evaporating faster, it can reach the, the vapor pressure can equal the atmospheric pressure at a lower temperature. So the higher the, the weaker the attractive force, the higher the vapor pressure, the lower the boiling point. You need to know that relationship. The weaker the attractive force, the higher the vapor pressure, the lower the boiling point. And that kind of goes hand in hand Okay, we talked about this right here. Liquids that have high vapor pressure have weak attractive forces, right? And while liquids with low vapor pressures have stronger attractive forces. And then here, again, we're gonna use that transitive property. Boiling occurs when vapor pressure equals atmospheric pressure, okay? So if you have high pressure, the boiling point of a liquid, okay, uh, increases. So we can relate this to here, the vapor pressure and the boiling point. So I don't know, maybe in the margin out here is where you want to write that. High vapor pressure, weak attractive forces equals high vapor pressure equals low boiling points. That's what these two statements are kind of talking about. Now, did we fill in all of these spaces? Okay, so boiling occurs, let's look at 15. Boiling occurs when vapor pressure is equal to atmospheric. So if a high pressure weather system is in place, the boiling point of a liquid increases, whereas a low pressure is going to increase. So in the mountains, and I love this word, rarefied, Okay. Rarified means that the air is rare, it's spread out, it's less pressure, it's rarefied. 
That just always means lower pressure, okay? A lot of times in physics, they'll talk about a sound wave is a compression wave, it's a longitudinal. So when a guitar string strings or a speaker, it pushes and then it pulls. It pushes and pulls. It's a compression, compressed, rarefied. Compressed, then they use the word rarefied because it stretches and pulls the air apart. That's how sound is generated. A push and a pull, a push and a pull, a compression, and then a rarefaction. Compression, rarefaction, this great word. Sound, makes you sound smarter, okay? So, as a result, water boils, in the mountains, water's gonna boil at what? Lower, Lower temperature than at sea level. So how, what are the two ways we can make water boil? <laughs> Increasing the temperature or by decreasing the pressure. And then we had our four statements of the kinetic molecular theory. So we know that everything is made up of tiny particles and the, what, the smallest part of an element is an atom. The smallest part of a compound is a molecule. They're in continuous, rapid, random motion. You heat them up, you speed them up. You heat them up, you speed them up. You cool them down, you slow them down. What's the slowest you can go? Absolute zero. Which is how fast are the molecules moving at absolute zero? They're not moving, they stopped. You can't go any slower than zero. Okay, you can get within millions of a degree of it, but technically you can't get to it. And then what does it mean by all collisions between gas molecules are elastic? Like, they have like, like stress to when they stretch out. They can go back. Okay, they can go back to where they were. Okay, if, kind of be writing with one ear and listening with the other, I say this, but as you drop a basketball, does it bounce as high as you originally dropped it? No. Why not? No. Why does the basketball bounce as high? I heard what? Friction. Okay. You lose some of the energy due to friction. Some of the energy is transferred into the sound it makes when it hits the floor. Some of it is lost to air resistance. Those are called inelastic collisions. Energy is lost during the collision. But with gas molecules, when they collide, no energy is lost because they don't really collide. Their electron clouds get close to one another and they just repel like magnets. So inside this can right here, inside this can, okay, the molecules are colliding with the container walls. If it was like a basketball, it would be, you know, doesn't, it doesn't bounce as high, doesn't bounce as high, eventually comes to rest on the ground. The molecules in here would eventually stop bumping into the walls and the pressure would go down to nothing. Just, but the pressure inside this can is gonna stay the same until I do this, okay? But as long as it's in here, they don't lose any energy. They don't, they don't have any frictional losses like a basketball does when you drop it. That's what it means when we say collisions are elastic. No energy is lost, there's no frictional losses. The energy remains constant. One speeds up, one slows down, but the total energy stays the same. Basic stuff. 
We should know the, the, the definition of all of our different phase changes. Solid phase. Obviously solid going to a liquid, melting, okay? The reverse of that is freezing, okay? This is an advanced level, so I'm expecting y'all to be able to handle this, okay? Liquid to a gas is vaporization, or we call it boiling. Gas to a liquid is condensing. Okay, that's why again, you have a glass of iced tea, you can't put it on the wood table because the condensation on the outside leaves a ring on the table. You can't eat them on the That's why we have a thing called coasters. You put it on a coaster or you put it on a napkin, you put it on something so you don't ruin the expensive table that your parents worked their butts off to buy, okay? You appreciate the nice things that you have. Now, solid to a gas, sublimation, and that's what dry ice does. They call it dry ice because it doesn't go through the liquid phase. The solid just goes straight to a gas. Now the reverse of that is snow, a gas to a solid, we just call it deposition. That word you may not have heard before. That's gas to solid? That's a gas to a solid. So snow, the water vapor in the cloud freezes directly, doesn't become a liquid, and it makes snow. Hail is frozen water. So hail, hail is the result of the water freezing in the clouds. Okay, so there's a bit, it, usually hail happens in the summertime or when it's warm because you have this, you get cold air and warm air and then the warm air wants to rise up. So the water, the rain starts to fall, but then this big warm updraft takes it back up into the cold air and then it freezes, comes back down, but get blown back up, freezes again, gets another layer of water, goes back up, freezes again. Depending upon how strong that updraft is, is how big the hailstone can get before it's heavier than the wind can hold up. So on a big, bad storm that's got these big, strong winds that are going up, you can get the big, you know, baseball-sized hail. I mean, that's a lot of pretty strong wind to be able to throw that up. But that's hail. Freezing rain is when it's warm here and cold here. So as the raindrop falls through the cold air, it freezes on the way down. That's just the difference between hail and, and uh, freezing rain sleet. Okay. Just a little meteorological lesson for you on this fun Friday. Okay. So you got snow, hail, and sleet. All frozen precipitate, precipitation. Okay. So obviously we need to know these. Okay, we good with that? Well, that's up to you. I would suspect that I suspect that four out of the six are pretty obvious. Okay. I would hope that four out of the six is not new information. Okay. Maybe that, and you've, I know you've learned the term sublimation before, but it may not just be a word that you keep it fresh in your vocabulary, and you probably may not have heard this deposition before. Okay. So. What you, hey, whether you write any of this down is totally up to you. I don't ever check your notes. You are big boys and girls now. You, you know what it takes um, to learn. So we have this is in your book on page 335 in your book. This is a phase diagram for water. We've already said we can control the temperature at which water boils and even which, te which temperature water freezes if we control the pressure and the temperature. So all along this line, okay, this is the normal boiling point of water right here, okay? But if I decrease the pressure, which is what I did the other day, and we made water boil, was this this class that I struggled yeah. with? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. I changed vacuum pumps. Okay. Did you ever try the ethanol thing? Well, I, I, yeah, that one didn't ever really want to work either. These vacuum pumps just aren't that good. Because they're new. They're probably made in America. Okay, you can see, uh, hey, also, you can see all in here, I did this in first period, and all the condensation on the inside already, 
okay? Because it vaporized at the low pressure, but then when the pressure went back to normal, then it recondensed on the, on the surface here, okay? I'm just gonna get all this condensation off of this, so hopefully I can get a good seal. Now I turn this on. And I begin sucking the air out of this. Okay, so now you can see it's it's, it's boiling vigorously. Okay? Now, it is not hot. I'm not heating it up at all. So instead, instead of putting it on the stove and heating it up to increase the vapor pressure, instead, I'm decreasing the pressure until down here at 25, 30 degrees. Now it's going to boil at a much lower temperature. It's actually the opposite, and we're going to do that next week. Okay? So. Letting the air back in. So now I can take this off. Okay? So stick your finger in there. Is it hot? Well, it's like, is that, is, is it even warm? No. no. <laughs> okay, it's not here. Luke, you asked the question. No, I asked. No, I you said, I is it hot? That's what I said, is it hot? Oh, it's so cold. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. It's new. It's new. Well, I actually cheated on this one. Okay, it's just water, y'all. No, it's very hot water. Okay. It's not hot water at all, but it was boiling. Okay, I cheated. I used warm water. Okay, out of the, but it was warmer than that when I put it in there. So why did it cool off? So what? A lot of the energy got brought out when it boiled. Okay, because how? In order to make the water boil, what do we have to do with bonds? You got to break the water molecules up, specifically the hydrogen bonds. Again, remember, when water boils, what's in the bubble? Water, not hydrogen and oxygen. So when you have it here, you have to break the hydrogen bonds from each other. Breaking bonds always requires energy. So you're going from here to here. You're having to put in that heat of vaporization. Okay, that energy's gotta come from somewhere. It comes from all the other molecules in the water. Another way you can look at it is, temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy. Shelby, you're, 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 there we go. Okay? Temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy. Some are going fast, some are going slow. If I boil water, the high speed molecules are the ones that are leaving. So what does that do to the average? If I have to give a test in here and I take a class average, and then I start taking the high grades out, what happens to the class average? It goes down, it goes down right? Mm -hmm. If I have high speed molecules being taken out of a solution, what happens to the average, sorry, Delaney, what happens to the average temperature, average speed of the molecules if the high speed ones are leaving? It goes down, it goes down therefore the temperature goes down. Boiling is a cooling process. So when your car boils over in the summertime, my phone's dying already? Yeah. It said yeah. it's the second time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, no, they put the, no, they just came out with a new iOS, and so it's going to make my battery go down faster, so they're going to make me want to buy a new phone. Yeah. And so, darn Apple. Okay. <laughs> this is why I have so, so, we're almost done anyway.
Okay, so boiling when your car boils over in the summertime, okay, it's actually cooling off as the hot water, as the high speed molecules leave, it, your engine actually cools as it boils over. All right, so if I'm looking at this graph, obviously this is the solid state, this is the liquid state, this is the gas state or the vapor state. What is that triple point? That's like the point where like, it automatically boils in the like it's, it's constantly No. It's after parts of the water are all freezing, boiling, and staying in the state. You have all three phases occurring at the same time. You have ice, water, and steam all at the same time. Now, only one particular temperature and pressure, almost a near vacuum, 0 0.01 degrees. You have to have the exact condition, then you can get all three phases existing at the same time. This tells me at what temperature and pressure water will boil. This temperature shows me at what temperature it's going to freeze. Now, most substances, the line is going to look like this because pushing on it is going to cause it to contract. So, we're going to work on a worksheet for the rest of the period, just with a phase diagram. And what we want to do is just kind of be able to interpret this graph. I don't know how many this is. That's more than three, but I... Yeah. Wait, so are we able to duplicate at the triple point? Yeah. Okay, well, I can't, but I mean, people can. What does it look like? You can't, because you can't see the steam, the water vapor, so you don't really get to see much, that's why I don't worry about them. Okay. Um, but you just have like ice water with some with steam. We just get that air. And they'd all be in equilibrium with one another. Okay. Okay. Did we have extras over here? Did you pass them back? Okay. So let's go. Th you go through and see what you can do on one through six. See if you can interpret these, and uh, we'll look at those in five minutes. But you can go ahead and y'all have a wonderful weekend. Hope you enjoyed this video. <laughs> it does. It does like